Uh, I really felt a burden to say a word of encouragement in our message today, especially to those who have just made decisions to follow Jesus, some of you who maybe have grown discouraged in the way, and others who are still preparing. Uh, our message will be a little shorter, in case you're wondering, I see what time it is. I'd like to talk about the great temptation of Jesus. And that, of course, is found three places in the Bible. You can find it in Matthew chapter 4. The story is also in Mark chapter 1, verse 12, and Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. One of the few places in the Gospels where Matthew 4 and Luke 4 parallel the same chapter and the same story. The reason I'm picking this is because what we typically call the great temptation or the temptation of Jesus, when did it come? Right after his baptism. And as a pastor, I'm especially concerned uh, for baby Christians that they understand that when they're married to Jesus and they have their honeymoon, like some marriages, the honeymoon sometimes uh, has a dark day before it's all over. Or sometimes there's some surprises. I don't know any other delicate way to say that. But um, people are sometimes surprised. They have the, the glory of... The heavens being opened, God declares you're now their child, they feel their sins washed away, they've crossed the Red Sea, and lo and behold, they get attacked by the Amalekites. They did not expect it. And we need to brace ourselves, because the Christian life has battles. Notice that Jesus was not baptized because he was washing away his sin, but as an example for you and me. In, in a similar fashion, the temptation of Christ, or what we sometimes call the great temptation, or the temptation in the wilderness, Christ there gave us an example for victory. And so I think there's something that all of us can learn from in this story. Amen? Turn in your Bibles. I'm going to use the story in Matthew as our catalyst. There's only a few verses here, but we'll consider them carefully. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now keep in mind, at the baptism of Jesus, God the Father declared audibly with his own voice, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. A very clear declaration that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. When God speaks audibly from heaven, it happens very rarely in the Bible, it's something that we should take note of. Now, right after that experience, it says he's led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It almost sounds like he's being tempted by the Spirit. Or the Spirit is saying, okay, it's time for you to go be tempted. That's not what's really happening here. It's simply saying the Spirit led him into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. Now, keep in mind, after baptism begins ministry. After the baptism of Jesus, he began his ministry. Jesus performed no miracles that we know of before his baptism. No healings, no preaching. The only declaration we know of is where he said to his parents, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? That's all he says. He knew at an early age he was to be about his father's business, but he began his ministry at his baptism. If you've been baptized, God gives you the Holy Spirit there's a promise. You may not feel it. It comes like a dove, not like a lightning bolt. Some people think when you get the Holy Spirit, it's always lightning and you shake and you fall on the ground and go into convulsions. And that's the Holy Spirit. No, it came like a dove. Still small voice. And God promises to give it to you. Acts chapter 2, Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will. You shall. That's a promise that you claim. Amen? And so those of you who have been baptized, some of you it may have been years ago, God promised to give you the Holy Spirit. Have you cashed in on that? You cash in on that the same way you cash in on any Bible promise. You say, I believe it, and you claim it, and it becomes real. You don't wait to feel something. You believe it, and then the feeling may come. But faith before feeling. Now Christ was given the Holy Spirit to begin His ministry, but before He began His ministry... He wanted to consecrate and baptize that ministry through prayer. He went into the wilderness for 40 days to pray. Notice that Moses 
before his greatest ministry of delivering God's people, he went into the wilderness, he crossed the Red Sea, he went into the wilderness and worked for 40 years as a shepherd in preparation for delivering the children of Israel. So as Jesus spent 40 days fasting before his great ministry, Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness preparing for his great ministry. And it says, in the wilderness, he was fasting. Now, of course, Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights up on the mountain as well. And he was hungry. It doesn't say he was thirsty. Jesus probably had water in the wilderness. Uh, the Bible does tell about the most severe fast that you find is where Paul didn't eat or drink for three days. You can live 40 days without food or longer. I remember there was someone from the IRA who was in prison, went on a hunger strike. He lived 80 days before he died of malnutrition, did not eat any food, but he had to drink. Now God is not asking you to fast 40 days and 40 nights. I think Jesus did that for us. There is still a place to fast. The Bible has a lot to say about fasting and prayer, especially about important things. What could be more important than the ministry and the mission of God's son? That's why he spent 40 days fasting and praying. Jesus said when his disciples were casting out devils and they were unsuccessful with this one case, he said, this kind does not come forth except by fasting and prayer. The bigger the mission, the bigger the challenge, the more we may need to pray and invest our energy to seeking after God. And he was hungry. Christ felt what humans feel. Now this is a very controversial issue, this subject about how did Jesus get tempted? First of all, is it a sin to be tempted? No. We're all tempted. Jesus was tempted, and the Bible says, yet without sin. But keep in mind, in order to be tempted, there must be some attraction there. For instance, you cannot tempt a hummingbird to eat a dead rabbit on the road. They're not interested. They fly right by. They fly away. They're not interested. There's no temptation there. There's no craving, there's no desire, there's no interest, there's no appeal. A buzzard is different. That's an overwhelming, uh, overwhelming temptation for a buzzard, a dead rabbit on the road. They can't resist it. So in order for Christ to be tempted, are you listening? This is very important. In order for it to even be called a temptation, that means that Jesus must have inherited from his family tree that you read in Matthew, very colorful family tree, some of those tendencies of the fallen human nature. He never sinned, but he overcame the way you and I overcome. That's how he can be an example for you and me. That's why he's a faithful high priest. The Bible tells us that he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. Now there'll be some who I respect who may disagree with me on this, but that's the only way I can call this temptation. So he's in the wilderness. We know Jesus got thirsty. He declared that on the cross. It says here he was hungry. Every cell in his body was yearning for nutrients. Have you ever been really hungry? You know, typically the average American lunches an hour late and we need fast food because we're starving, right? <laughs> we're not starving. Uh, have you ever fasted a day or two or three? Not because you're sick. But just because you're praying and everywhere you turn, you're thinking about eating. Forty days and his body is crying out. Now it's in this state that the devil comes to him and I want to bring this up right away. When Satan came to him in the wilderness to tempt him, how did the devil appear? Did suddenly this red creature, hideous creature with leotards and the black cape and the horns and the goatee and the pitchfork plop down on the ground and say, Hi, I'm the devil. I'm here to tempt you. Would, would you listen to anybody who looked like that that came to tempt you? I remember reading this in the Bible. I thought my first picture is he was tempted by the devil. The devil was green or red or something, you know, and he came looking like a devil, a dragon, something. But what does the Bible say about how Satan appears? Second Corinthians 11, 14. It tells us no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? He came to Christ as a heavenly messenger. 
as an angel of light, and he knows how to look good. He was the most beautiful of God's creatures. Furthermore, Jesus said that Satan is a master of masquerading to be something more innocent than he is. Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you how? In sheep's clothing, the devil dresses up in innocent, meek apparel, but he's a wolf. And he comes in religious garb, like a shepherd or like a sheep. Paul says even his ministers can't appear to be ministers of righteousness, but they're really wolves. And so I believe when the devil came to Jesus, that he came as an angel from heaven, come to encourage him. Now follow me. You remember when Elijah ran in the wilderness for 40 days, at the end of his 40 days of hunger, did an angel come and feed him? Yeah, so this would be biblical. Did God miraculously feed the children of Israel in the wilderness of 40 years of wandering? Yeah. And so to have this messenger visit him was, was not that unusual. The Bible says in Matthew 4, 2, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. He had water to drink, but he was hungry. When does the devil typically come to us to tempt us? When you are weak, you are tired, you are at the lowest ebb. And notice what else. He was alone. You can read in the Gospel of Mark, it says he was in the wilderness with the wild beasts. He's got no human companionship, the same way that Daniel was with the lions in the den. He was out there in the wilds, far from any human. And when he was alone is when the devil came. When did the serpent come to Eve? When she was alone. She obviously was separated from Adam at that time. When was it that Peter denied Jesus? When he was tired, when he was separated from his support group of the other eleven. And that's when the devil comes. When we're weak, low blood sugar, don't ever have... Don't ever have a deep discussion with your spouse when you're hungry. <laughs> if you've got something heavy to deal with, with somebody, feed them first. Do it in the morning. Wait until you can get some rest because the devil will capitalize on your fatigue. Amen? Anyone out there second that? And it says that he was there in the wilderness tempted. And the devil appeared, not as an angel of light, but he came, or not as a, a demon, but he came as a beautiful angel. And the tempter came and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, obviously, there on the desert floor were probably all of these water, weather, wash, uh, rounded stones, and some of them probably looked like, uh, with a little touch-up of an artist, they could be loaves of bread. And the devil's first temptation addresses the same thing that happened with Eve's first temptation. You see, with Adam and Eve, God said to them, If you eat of the forbidden tree, you will die. The Word of God declared something very clearly. The devil comes shortly after God and he says God didn't really mean what he said. What was the first temptation that came to Jesus? God didn't really mean you're his son. Do you really believe that? Are you sure? The devil comes to create questions and doubts about God's word. The first temptation was dealing with questioning and doubting the word of God and using his supernatural power to take a shortcut and to take care of his physical needs. Use your power or abuse your power. Now, did Jesus have the power to turn those stones into bread? We know that he could turn two loaves into enough to feed thousands. So it would be no problem for him to turn stones into bread. The Bible says he can make stones cry out. He can do whatever he wants with the elements. He can make a donkey talk. He can make water come out of a rock. Turning a stone into bread is nothing for Jesus. So he had the power to do it. Can you understand what a temptation this was for Jesus to know that he had it within his power to do this and he resisted that abuse of power? You know, it's easy for us sometimes when we think that we can take a shortcut and exercise power falsely that God has given us or to use the ability or our relationship with God for selfish means. The Bible teaches the exact opposite of this. 
There is a doctrine that's floating around that if you trust the Lord, that you can pray for whatever you want and God's going to give it to you. But Christ would not abuse his power this way. How does he answer? He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Christ now quotes the word of God. The first thing that happens here in this temptation is Jesus establishes the rules of engagement. You notice that Christ does not use some flame of genius that sparked in his mind. Jesus does not use the philosophy and the rationalizations of the world to try and dialogue with the devil. Don't ever do that. When Eve began to dialogue with the devil, she was overpowered. He was too shrewd. Don't debate with the devil. He simply with clear, concise, short authority quoted the word of God. He said, it is written, God has spoken. And you know what? He didn't debate with the devil and say, what do you mean? You were there. Didn't you hear God say that I'm his beloved son? He did not even engage on his own ground. He stayed on the word of God as his foundation. The only ground on which Jesus would meet the devil was it is written. And you know what's interesting? Christ is the word. He could have created new utterances and oracles. He could have spoken it would have been the word of God. But he went back to what was already declared. Isn't that something when you think about that? He quoted the Old Testament. Jesus could have said, I'm making some New Testament words for you now, Satan. Here's what it is. But no, he put so much value on the words that he gave to Moses and the prophets that he continually referred back to what he had already spoken. Never underestimate what a gift we have in the word of God. This is what Jesus used to combat the devil every step of the way. He also would not put his physical needs above spiritual. Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word. When you've got to make a choice between the physical and the spiritual hunger, Christ said you must feed the spirit first. Man shall not live by bread alone. So this, is the first, this was the first temptation. What did Jesus use to fight it? He used the sword of God's word. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It tells us in Ephesians, and the sword of the spirit that is the word of God and so he used the same weapon that is available to you and me he used the sword of God's word to combat the devil Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God he used the shield of faith now what does the Bible tell us in Ephesians that we're supposed to do with the shield of faith it says that you use it to deflect the fiery darts of the enemy so Christ used that shield of faith. If you've got the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, those are the two best weapons for fighting temptation. Now, this message is not for those of you here that are never tempted. So who would this apply to? I'm just wondering, is there anyone here this message doesn't apply to? If you're not tempted, you know what that means? You're making no effort to resist. And if you're making no effort to resist, that's the only way you can say you're not being tempted. Second temptation... Oh, one more thing. Second Peter, uh, chapter 1, verse 4. How do we fight the devil? By which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. The promises of God's word. That through these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Same nature that Jesus had that he used to fight the devil. Having escaped the world, the corruption that is in the world through lust. The Bible tells us that through the promises of God's word we can escape the corruption that's in the world. All right, temptation number two. The Bible says in Matthew 5, I'm sorry, Matthew 4, verse 5, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Now, whoa, wait a second now. Devil, you're not allowed to quote the Bible. That's against the rules. As a matter of fact, you know, some people think you take your Bible, you shake it at the devil. You know, I used to read about where you would shake a cross at the vampire. Any of you ever watch those old, don't show your hands, movies, you know, you hold up garlic. The, some of us still do that today. We, or you hold up a cross to try to get rid of the, the vampire. And some people think you can do that with the Bible. You know, you hold it up to the devil and he cowers and he runs from the, the Bible. But the devil, he'll take it out of your hands and quote it to you. He's not intimidated by, you notice, where did the devil take him? He took him to church. And he quotes the Bible. Wow! Is the devil afraid of religion? The devil's not afraid of the Bible. 
when he can twist it to his own purposes. And you know what else he did? He didn't quote the Bible. He misquoted the Bible. He misquoted Psalm 91. Takes him to church, puts him on the pinnacle of the temple. You know, Josephus tells us, in the modern pictures we've got of the temple, we don't know how high that was because, uh, you know, based on Solomon's design, it didn't have any really high point. But evidently in the restoration at the time of Jesus, Josephus says there was a pinnacle 450 to 500 feet tall. You ever been 500 feet up? I remember when we put out Channel 27, I started climbing up this 300 foot tower, this radio tower. You get halfway up. And even though you've got a firm grip and you know you're in good health and your head starts to swim, 150 feet up, you get up to those heights and it could be pretty frightening. And he takes them up there and he says, cast yourself down, for it is written. He starts to quote Psalm 91. He will give his angels charge over you and he leaves part out where it says to keep you in all your ways. And in his hands they'll bear you up last year, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And you know something else that occurred to me today I've never thought about before. What verse was the devil quoting? Psalm 91, verse 12. What was it? Psalm. What's a psalm? Now, any of you know how to sing the tunes that David sang to those original psalms? We've lost them all. The written music of the Hebrews, we don't know. We have no copies of it. It's like hieroglyphics before the Rosetta Stone. We don't know what the melodies were to the Psalms of David. Did the devil know? Do you think Jesus still knew? Were they still singing them then? When the devil quoted Psalm 91, do you think that he did it with melody in his voice? You think it was moving and there Jesus is up. He's overlooking Jerusalem. He's on the pinnacle of the temple. And Satan begins to use music. Cast yourself down. For it is written. And he starts to sing. Sing that verse. Leaves part of it out that says they'll keep you in all your ways because if an angel is keeping you in your ways, they don't lead you to the top of the pinnacle of a temple. Right? That little part he left out would have diffused it even more. Christ does not meet him on his ground. He does not try to correct him. He again resorts to the word of God. Quoting again from Deuteronomy, which is my favorite book in the Old Testament. Jesus said to him, It is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You notice that the devil uh, tries to get us to presume on God. Now some people, they'll read in the Bible where it says, if you've got faith, you'll take up serpents. It doesn't exactly say that, but you know, there are churches that twist that a little bit, and they think if you've got faith, they actually bring rattlesnakes to church. Have you heard of that? Let me see your hands. You've heard of these churches? They're more predominant in... Where you're from, John? Sorry. <laughs> in the South. And um, they actually keep snakes in their churches. And they quote that scripture. And my Bible says you're not to tempt the Lord. Now, if you're Paul and you're making a fire like it says an axe and a snake comes out and grabs you on the hand and you lift up your hand and shake it off in the fire, that's what Christ was talking about. The venom won't hurt you if you get bit and you take up a snake. That's what it means. You're bit and it's hanging on to you. It doesn't mean you go looking for snakes. That's tempting the Lord. And some of you think, Doug, no problem. Let's go on to the next temptation. I've got this one down. But do we? This is talking about presuming, presumption. Some people will step into sin and then assume that they can repent later. They're jumping off the pinnacle of the temple and hoping an angel catches them. You'll get a Christian girl who will start dating an unbeliever and she'll say, well, I'm just going to jump in and trust that God's going to convert them later. Uh, that's the same sort of thing, isn't it? It's tempting the Lord. It's asking for some supernatural intervention to overrule your presumption. And I think that uh, if the Lord could unravel the microfilm in our lives and show us, we'd see that we do that more often than we think. Tempting the Lord to sin. Third temptation. Matthew chapter 4 verse 8. And again the devil takes him up to an exceeding high mountain. I don't know where he took him. You know, the devil's transporting him somewhere. Uh, it may not even be in the promised land. He could have taken him to Everest, Kilimanjaro. I have no idea. But he took him to this mountain, majestic vantage point. And from this high mountain, he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And it also adds, in a moment of time, in the Gospel of Luke, I believe it is, 
very quickly. He gives him an intense vision. Is the devil a master of light? Can he create illusions? And he shows him all the glorious kingdoms of the world from the vantage of this mountain top. And he doesn't show him the slums. He shows him Babylon, the golden city. Medo-Persia and its heyday. Maybe Rome uh, with all the glistening marble. And he shows him all of the beautiful spots of the world. And he says, all this is yours. And you know, keep in mind what's really going on here, what he's saying to Jesus. He's saying, you don't have to die to save the sins of the world, or for the sins of the world to save them. The world's a beautiful thing. I will give it to you. I have control over it. Look, I've got, I've got it on slide right here. I can show it to you. I know where all the beautiful cities are. I'll give you an instant travel log. It's mine. I'm the prince of this world and I'm going to give it to you. You don't need to die. You don't need to go through with your mission. See, Christ is preparing for his mission. The devil knows what he's been praying about for the last 40 days and the devil does not want him to go through with it. And he's using these three areas of temptation to change his mind. And you know what the devil does? He shows them the cities of the world and their glory. Isn't he an expert at making that with his ugly look good? Typically, when you think of cities, what do you have in cities in the world? Concentrations of good or concentrations of evil? The bigger the city, typically, the more poverty, the more disease, the more crime, the more drugs. Am I right? Isn't that typical? The bigger the police force, more cemeteries, more funerals. But he doesn't show them that. He shows them their glory. Are there places in Las Vegas that look dazzling? How do you know? <laughs> we all know. Sure, the devil's an expert at that. But he doesn't show you those streets where people are in the gutter, vomiting from the alcohol, or hiding behind a building with a needle hanging out of their arm. And that's really what's happening between the neon bulbs in Las Vegas. The devil doesn't want you to see that. He's a master of advertising. He shows them all the cities of the world and their glory. The sin in the world is not that bad. You don't need to die. It's not that ugly. I'll just give it to you, as is. You don't have to follow through with this plan. Just one little fine print here. I, I should mention, you ever notice at the end of the commercial sometimes somebody says something on the radio very quickly? The legal language. The devil's got the fine print now. It's the part of the announcement that goes, offer not broad, but if you don't believe it. You know that, what I'm talking about? Or the fine print. I saw this guy advertising this thing on the news the other day, CNN. It was a commercial. And this guy is advertising this arthritic medication. He's making it sound like it's worked wonders for him. And there in fine print I saw, uh, it said, the artist paid for endorsement. And very small, which means he didn't really care. They're giving him money to say these things. And the fine print, the fast talk was, you just need to fall down and worship me made it sound like it was a little thing to do. But this is the big issue. What was it that the devil said to Adam and Eve? You'll be like gods. The appeal for the divine. Are you really the son of God? You seem to have doubts. You can't turn these stones into bread. God isn't anywhere here. These angels have left you that are supposed to feed you. See, Satan is now pulling aside his cloak and really revealing who he is. I'll give it to you. Notice something else. With the temple, with the mountain, he takes him to a very high spot before he fires at him. Does the devil fire at those in positions of visibility? Where is it the easiest to be tempted? When you're on your knees in the valley of despair or when you're on some precipice? When was it that the devil came to David with Bathsheba walking on his roof? Isn't that how it happens? When you're riding high, you're at the zenith of your success, you better be careful. He that thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. It was on the high places that the devil brought the temptations to Jesus. When he was alone, in church, quoting the Bible, you know what that means also. I need to back up to temptation too. You need to at least know your Bible as well as the devil does because he'll, requ he'll twist it, right? We need to really be studying the Word. And what did um, he say? All these things I'll give you 
if you will fall down and worship me. You know, it tells us in Isaiah that the devil said, I will be like the Most High. This is the great controversy. The devil wants Jesus throne. Here you have the creation asking the Creator to bow down. Does that sound backwards? But this is what's going on. And you know, it really looked like a reversal of roles because here Satan is glowing with the divinity of the glory of an unfallen angel. Here's Jesus. He's emaciated. He's gaunt. His lips are parched. He's sunburned. His feet are chapped. He's got cactus thorns in the back of his legs. He doesn't look like the Creator. And here's this glorious angel. Everything visual about that situation would lead you to think, uh, Jesus should worship this angel. That would be appropriate. Did some of the prophets fall down and worship angels mistakenly? Did John worship an angel in Revelation? And the angel said, Ch -ch -ch, don't do that. It's against the law. Worship God only. Daniel fell down before the angels. Isaiah fell down. They all fell down in the presence of these holy beings. And here, Lucifer, the highest of the angels, before his fall, he's now saying to Jesus, who is in a suffering human condition, just fall down and worship me. It must feel natural. Just like it was for the three Hebrews on the plain of Dura, when they heard the music and they saw that golden image gleaming in the sun. They felt like worshiping. But Jesus would not give in. Matter of fact, he is repulsed by this suggestion. His answer comes very quickly. He rejects the proposal with abhorrence. And he says, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. You know, another parallel with Moses. It was after 40 years in the wilderness that Moses saw from a mountain the glory of the promised land and then he died after 40 days in the wilderness the devil showed Jesus the glory of a fallen world isn't that interesting they both had similar visions Moses from Mount Pisgah we don't know what mountain the devil took Jesus to but Christ is that prophet like Moses Deuteronomy 18 prophesied would come and then the Bible says the devil departed from him for a season now, did the devil go for good? You know, the Bible promises in James, if James chapter 4, if you submit yourself to God, which Jesus did during that 40 days, if you resist the devil, what will he do? He will flee from you. You will have oases of peace even in this life. There will be episodes where the devil has to regroup. It is not just one temptation after another, moment after moment. But you're going to see the temptation comes often in waves. Amen? That's how he works. It's like any war. You know, you regroup and then you another wave of an assault. And the devil had to go lick his wounds. He left him for a season. That means not for good. Now, that's good news. That means he does leave. The bad news is only for a season. He's going to come back. As long as you and I are in this world the devil is going to be there. Do we need to know something about temptation and how to overcome? Matter of fact, this little window that we're studying today is really a precursor to the full sermon I'll share with you a uh, future time. I've got 14 points I've been going through on how to resist and how to overcome temptation. How many of you would like to know what those are? These are things I've developed for my own need. Don't think pastors aren't tempted. Everybody's tempted, amen? And the Bible says that after Satan left him, the Bible says, then angels came and ministered to him. You know, I think, what do you think the angels did? Do you think they gave him a back rub? What do you think they did? What did the angels do for Elijah when Elijah was running through the wilderness for 40 days? He was exhausted. They said, the trip is too much for you. They gave him food and drink. They ministered to his practical needs. Now, something I want you to notice about the temptation of Jesus. He, Jesus is the second Adam. You read in Romans about how the first Adam, made perfectly in the image of God, with absolutely no propensity to sin or inherited tendency to sin in his nature, he fell. Adam fell in the beginning of the Old Testament where he was in a paradise. 
In the beginning of the New Testament, Jesus, who is the second Adam, how many of you know what I'm talking about when the Bible says Jesus is the second Adam? He is the Son of God. Just like Adam, the Bible says Adam had no father but God. Jesus was born miraculously. He is the second Adam, the Son of God. The first Adam falls in a paradise surrounded with every need being met and he falls to the devil's temptation. Jesus, in the beginning of the New Testament, he overcomes in all the areas where Adam and Eve fell. The second Adam succeeded, yet he's in a wilderness and he's starving. You know, that's really encouraging. You know, the reason that's encouraging is because the same way that you and I know that we suffer from the fall of the first Adam, we can lay claim to the victory of the second Adam. The same way that Jesus overcame, we can overcome. How many of you believe that Christ's baptism is an example for what we can expect? That we follow. The heavens open, the heavens are open for us. God says, you're now my beloved son or daughter. We are adopted into the family by God. The Holy Spirit comes like a dove. All the things that Christ experienced belong to us. Not only with Jesus' baptism, but with his temptation. Now you say, Doug, I don't like that part. You need to like that part. The part I want you to like is, he was victorious. The same way that Christ was baptized as an example, he overcame as an example for you and me. How many temptations were there? Three. Some of you are thinking, Doug, I wish that was the only thing that I ever faced is three temptations. Really, there are only three temptations. Second John, no, First John chapter 2, verse 15 says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. How many is that? Three main areas of temptation. They're not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God will abide forever. In the Garden of Eden, when Eve was tempted, how many temptations were there? There's just three. Genesis 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. She took and she ate. She gave to her husband and he did eat. He did eat. Christ was tempted through his senses. He was tempted to test the supernatural. He was tempted to take shortcuts. All temptations that you face fall into one of these three categories. All of the Ten Commandments fall under one of those three. Matter of fact, the first four commandments, worship someone other than God, would fall under that. Just that one temptation. And you cannot name a sin that doesn't in some way appeal to either the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, or the pride of life. Because Jesus overcame and was victorious in these three areas, Satan lost. Amen? Satan was defeated. Christ was victorious, meaning that you and I can be defeated. You know, the part that I especially enjoy is the fact that Christ can be a faithful high priest for you and me because of what he's done. Hebrews 4, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but who was in all points tempted as we are. In all points. Only three. Those three covered how many points? And was that the only time in Jesus' life he was tempted? No. He was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. The Bible promises that with every temptation that may come, first of all, God is not going to allow you, he will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able. You know what that means? That means that somewhere there's a way of escape with every temptation that comes. God is going to make a way of escape. He'll move the mountains, he'll part the sea, but you've got to know that if I'm being tempted, that's good news, God's going to provide a way of escape. He will not allow me to be tempted above what I'm able to bear. God has a scale in heaven where he weighs out what temptation you can handle. And if it's a big temptation, that means he trusts that you have the strength with his power to resist it. Amen? Don't you ever say it's more than I can bear. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. Through Christ I can do how much? All things. The other verse I wanted to share with you is Hebrews 2 verse 18. For that in he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to help to aid those who are tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. We're tempted every day. That's why we need to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. What that means is lead us away from our natural bent to temptation. You know, I heard that there was this artist. I read about that this, this week. His name was Joseph Mallard Turner, famous English artist. 
And he took all of his paintings very seriously. This specific painting of a storm and a shipwreck, before he painted that, he went up to the coast of New Finland, I believe it was, and he, uh, I'm sorry, of uh, uh, Norway, and he paid a, a sailor to take him out when the next storm came along. Not only did he take him out, but he said, I want you to tie me to the mast. He thought, you're crazy, but he paid him well, so he said, if that's what you want. So he takes his artist and he straps him securely to the mast of the ship and they go out in a storm that was a nine on the Richter scale. They did not expect it to be so bad, but those North Atlantic storms in the winter can be horrendous. And the spray was in his face and the mast was dipping into the water and he was coming up and the wind is howling in hurricane velocity. He comes back barely alive. After he recovers, he paints his picture. And he was explaining to someone who was admiring the picture. He said, that's beautiful. How are you able to capture all the intensity, the reality of a storm? He says, I was part of the storm. I was in the storm as much as anybody can be in a storm. You know why Jesus is a faithful high priest? He was strapped to the mast for you and me, wasn't he? He went up on the cross, not only in the wilderness, but on the cross. And he met the devil on his own ground and he beat him. And he is an example for you and me. The Bible says he has set an example that we should walk as he walked. Now there's so much more to this issue of victory. But I especially wanted to offer a word of encouragement to those of you who are just baptized. Don't be frightened. Don't be shaken. If you're shortly after your baptism, you, you need to be really praying during this time. Amen? Just after Christ's baptism, he prayed. He consecrated himself. He meditated on the word of God. Fill your mind with the word of God. There may come a temptation. You can count on it. The devil's probably figuring out what will work for you. He may use your friends. He'll try and separate you. He'll try and make you weak or tired or sick or something. Isn't this exciting to think about? But then you can know that if you keep your eyes on Jesus, you can lay aside every weight and every sin. You can be victorious through Christ. I want to offer special prayer for those who've been baptized today. Matter of fact, we're getting a picture. We've got a gift for them. All of you who are baptized today and earlier this week, please come up on the platform with me. We want to have special prayer for you at this time. And following the service, I would encourage our church family to give these folks a special welcome into the family. Amen? Don't be, don't be timid. Come on up here. Uh, we want to have a special prayer for you. I believe Pastor Mike also has some gifts that we want to give you. And um, we're going to feed our guests after the service. So, isn't this exciting, friends? These people that have made decisions. Are, it's like babies being born in the family. And we're just so thrilled and excited and praising God for these decisions. But we don't want to catch the fish and let them dry on the beach. We want to surround these people with prayer now and with our support as the days go by and to encourage them. There are some others who were baptized Tuesday because they knew they would be traveling this week. We'll introduce uh, some of these folks who joined the Central family later. We're going to be getting pictures of these people following um, our closing prayer today. And they'll be in the new directory that's being prepared. And uh, let me see how. How do we want to do this? Let's have prayer now and then we'll sing a song together as, as we give these different gifts to you, okay? Could we kneel? Here, could we kneel and pray for these people? Those who are able. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful that we can look to Jesus, who is a faithful high priest. He was strapped to the mast. He knows about the blast of the storm. And I pray that we can keep our eyes upon him and walk in his steps. Lord, we are claiming now the filling of your spirit for all of these people who have made this decision. I know there are some who are sitting in the congregation who have been baptized and they're still wondering if you've sent the Holy Spirit. Help them know that you've promised it for them. Help us to hear by faith you say that we are your beloved sons and daughters. Help us to know now that the sins were left behind, both spiritually and in a more literal sense, that we are clean in your sight because of this decision. And now, Lord, I'm praying that you'll not only infuse these people with your spirit, but prepare them for their life of ministry. Help them to recognize what their respective gifts are. I also want to pray for the church family, that we will, in a very practical way, in a very deliberate way,
place our loving arms around each one of these people and welcome them into our church family that will love them more than any earthly family could and that will integrate them in our family so they'll know they belong. So encourage and bless and seal and root these souls, Lord, in your word and in your people and in your church. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amazing Facts Ministry has been broadcasting the gospel since 1966 when it aired its first radio program in Baltimore, Maryland. Elder Joe Cruz was the speaker director for more than 30 years. At that time, no one dreamed that Amazing Facts would become a multifaceted worldwide ministry. The heartbeat of the gospel pulsating from this ministry is heard today on radio, television, the internet, the Correspondence Bible School, the publishing ministry, and local and worldwide evangelism. Pastor Doug Batchelor stepped into the leadership of the ministry after Joe Cruz died in 1994. Currently, Amazing Facts is on more than 100 TV stations and 11 satellite and cable networks throughout the United States, Europe, Australia, Central and South America, the Middle East, and Asia. For more information, call 1-800-835-6906.